if we look at it from a governmental perspective, governments around the world have obviously had the biggest weight to carry as a result of COVID. And just the weight of their decision making is terrible. I mean, to decide to lock up a city, a country, a state, that's a phenomenal burden to carry for any leader. And they've been able to achieve that. Whether you agree with them or not, they have to make those hard calls. But what we've seen from a financial sense is that they want economic recovery at any price. In Australia alone, over $350 billion worth of direct COVID support programs. You know, globally, billions and trillions of dollars being spent in America, Europe, everywhere to say, okay, how do we get things balanced? How do we keep our economy afloat? There is no end to the spend. So what I call blank check democracy, it's whatever it takes to keep everybody moving forward. You know, which is frightening to me. I don't like this whole thing. Now you see, in doing so, only a few countries have come back into growth from their pre-pandemic growth levels. So GDP is only now in positive from pre-COVID-19 you know, to now in probably four or five main countries. Everybody else is still smaller economy than before COVID started. So they haven't got in it. United Kingdom being one of the worst affected and India being the worst. Australia's done pretty well and is bigger economy today than pre-COVID. So you have to give credit where credit's due in the government of doing that. But the true cost, no one seems to talk about it. You know, should we have spent that amount of money? Should we spend the money that we're going to spend? You know, that seems to be just an automatic yes. No one seems to be doing cross checks, balances, whatever. And that does scare me because if we're just spending for the sake of spending, spending for the ideology, that can get, you know, pretty out of control pretty quickly. And we're all lost in the numbers. They're so huge now that how could you ever fully justify or understand? And no one is going to the detail to say, well, who is getting that and where is it going? And as a result, I think we've got a really long road before governments ever come back to financial normality. And you can see the, the uh, graph there on the bottom is the amount of stimulus, funding, you know, and direct loss of revenues that governments have experienced during COVID. It's significant. It's massively significant. You know, so people don't realize how big a dent it is. That's expressed as a percentage of what GDP was. It's huge money. If you're taking all that of your revenue as a government sense in terms of GDP and putting that back in, you know, it's going to take a long, long time to figure this out. And as a result, I'm worried from a global sense about what I call the deficit disorder. You know, it's arguments about ideology, but debt is debt in, in any language. And if you have a look where we've gone, here is a graph that shows you what is the debt levels of advanced economies, emerging economies, and, you know, and the low income developing nations. So you can see here that the debt levels have now increased significantly to well past 100% of GDP, pushing 120 on a global basis. You know, and that's true for emerging, uh, the advanced uh, um, economies. For the emerging ones, they're a bit less because they don't have the borrowing power that the advanced ones do. And then for the, the developing countries, they've still kicked up. Now, the great thing from a government point of view is that they've been doing this increased borrowing at a time when interest rates have been going ever low. So you can see there the actual interest expense being the yellow line through the graph is on the decline. So even though they're borrowing more money, it's costing them less. Now, that's been the great justification to say, look, let's just borrow heaps. It's cheap and let's go for it and fix things. Well, that's all well and good as long as interest rates stay where they are. Or if you can get it remedied before rates start rising and get it paid down before that interest cost creeps up. Because if you've got a large debt, when interest rates move from low to high, you've got big, big problems. And affordability you know, is going to be a big issue. Now, again, it's going to be the people that miss out because something's going to have to give. If the interest cost is going to be spent, then health might have to suffer. Education might have to suffer. So with all the governments not caring about this level of debt and not planning on the reduction, there is a potential risk of massive proportion down the line as interest rates come back to normal. Not only that, but that debt does put people under pressure because if you've got debt, you've got 
to be beholden to the person who lent you the money. And it begs the question, where did all this come from, this money? You know, who is providing the trillions of dollars and required for governments to do these stimulus packages? I don't know anyone who has a spare few trillion dollars aside. And not only that, I don't know anyone with a few billion or hundreds of millions that would lend it out at literally 0% interest. But if you look at the graph there all the way back to the 1800s, looking at the major events in the world, World War I, World War II, the, the uh, G, uh, uh, global financial crisis, and now what the IMF called the Great Lockdown. It's not the COVID recession, it's the Great Lockdown. You can see debt peaked up now to the highest level it has been since World War II. And we had been on a rapid repayment cycle, you know, right up through to the 70s. And then all of a sudden culture shifted to go, hey, let's borrow. Ironically, you can see when the government borrows less, interest rates are high. When the government's borrowing high, interest rates are low. Is that just coincidence? Probably not. But where is all this money coming from? at these low and cheap rates. It's staggering to believe. But again, with that debt now up at record levels you know, and interest rates low, everyone thinks that's okay. But if we look at the, the graph on the right-hand side, you know, look at the way that wealth is distributed. So this is the top 10% of income, the top 10% of assets. And you can see this is the unfairness in the world today. You can see the US leads the way. The top 10% of the, of the wealth you know, 20% of that top 10% is the income. So they get 20% of the, the whole country's income goes to the top 10%. But that's not that bad. But the big one is look at the asset value. The wealth is near on 80% of the wealth of that nation is held by the top 10% of the rich. That is crazy, disproportionate disbalance. That does not make sense. And of course, at a time like now, it gets better. Now, even Australia, you know, it's not too bad compared to the US. But if you look there, you've got around about 25% of the income you know, of the nation goes to the top 10%. And around about 45% of the wealth of the nation belongs to the top 10%. So that's not too bad compared to the US, but it's still a fairly big distortion. Now, whether you ideologically think that's okay or not, it does you know, raise questions. And again, with morality, is that what we're trying to achieve as a community in the world? And at a time like COVID, should that have got wider or smaller? You know, should there be more help from those wealthier people or not? Hard to know, but it depends where you stand. I suppose if I was a trillionaire, I'd be absolutely opposed to giving up some of my wealth. But if I'm poor, I want someone to help me. Anywhere in the middle is your position.